in terms of recovery efforts after conflict has occurred. And last week, we looked at a very specific case study of the 2014 earthquake in Nepal and subsequent response on both the community level as well as a little bit of the international level of response. And we, we heard from, in particular, a mountain guide that talked about her experiences before, during, and after the earthquake in small communities in Nepal. This week, we're going to continue to look at what we've learned from the past in terms of our present and future with a visiting historian, Dr. Jeff Crane, who's going to be with us for a couple days. So if you like listening to his lecture tonight, you can listen to him speak again tomorrow on a different topic focused on recreation and place-based literature in the Society and Conservation Seminar that's at 4 p.m. And I think it's in the class building in room 452, is that correct? Yes, I'm getting nods from faculty colleagues. So 452 tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, if you have follow-up uh, questions for Dr. Crane, feel free to email me and I can get you in touch with him. And then tonight, um, as you'll find out in my intro, he's the author of several books and we actually have um, his books for sale here tonight. Uh, Lauren's here from Fact and Fiction, so if you're interested in picking up a copy of um, his book he's going to read from tonight, you can do that as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead with my introduction. Dr. Jeff Crane grew up in Washington State on Whidbey Island. He attended Evergreen State College. He earned a bachelor's degree with an emphasis in American Studies and went on to secure his PhD in History at Washington State University. His scholarship thus far has focused on river development, protest against dams, impacts on salmon, uh, and other fisheries and river restoration efforts. His current scholarship work includes a focus on urban farming as a form of ecological protest and researching river and nearshore restoration efforts in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the beneficial impacts of restoration. Um, he's focusing a bit of that uh, study on restoration impacts also on climate change. He was faculty at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas for seven years and served as associate dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences of the, at the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas for three years. Um, eight months ago, he started as the dean of the College of Arts and uh, Sciences at St. Martin's University in Lacey, Washington, so he's found his way home to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he's the author and co-editor of three books. He published The Environment in American History, Nature and the Formation of the United States in 2014. He wrote Finding the River, an Environmental History of the Elwha that was published by Oregon State University in 2011. Um, and that was also a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. He co-edited with Dr. Michael Egan, Natural Protest, Essays on the History of the American Environmentalism that was published in 2008. Currently, he's working with Dr. Char Miller on the politics of hope, grassroots organizing, environmental justice, and social change. It's going to be published in late 2017 or early 2018. Um, tonight, Dr. Crane is going to be 
talking about a subject with the title, Bringing Life Back to Northwest Rivers and Near Shore Environments, the Elwha River and Nisqually Delta Rest River Restorations. And that's actually how I found Dr. Crane. Um, as, as most of your best finds in life, for me anyway, they tend to be brought on by long walks in places with not a lot of people. <laughs> and I was working my way up the Elwha River uh, shortly after they removed the dam and I um, had planned this 35 mile walk up to the headwaters of the Elwha, which is the, the headwaters are this, this really cool um, ice covered rock called the Elwha Snowfinger and that's basically where the headwaters of the Elwha start. So I was trying to work my way up to the headwaters of the Elwha early in the spring season and then ski across the Bailey Range to kind of pop out on the north side of the Olympics and go out. And as I was walking up the Elwha, um, the part of the road that you could drive, you could see where the dam had been taken out, which you couldn't actually see the area. They had it all fenced off. And, try as I might to get in there and actually like poke my way in and see any of the actual river, I couldn't see it. And so the whole way I was walking and I was the, one of the first hikers in that season, they hadn't cleared it, the trail crews hadn't been up, so I had a lot of hours going up and over huge Pacific Northwest trees that came down in spring storms. For those of you that have hiked in the, the Northwest forest, uh, you have a lot of time to just kind of think about things. And so I thought about the Owal River the entire time. And uh, came out of that trip and was like, I don't know anything about this river. And so I found Dr. Crane's book and um, was really excited to have the opportunity to bring him to campus. So with that, I will welcome him to this year's lecture series. Well, thank you, Natalie, for a very warm and generous introduction. Um, can everyone hear me in back OK? I'm really excited to be part of the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series. I think I told Natalie when I got the invitation, I ran out of the bedroom to go tell my wife. I was really excited about this. And I've been really excited hanging out with Natalie and Brian Chafin um, because it turns out we've read a lot of the same books, books like Fool's Crow, This House of Sky. We've hiked, backpacked, and snowshoed, and many. You were the first academic I've met who's uh, traveled in Attigan Pass which is in the Brooks Range of Northern Alaska. So that was particularly satisfying, being able to, to compare those stories. So I feel like I've, I'm meeting with some nice, like-minded people. And so I want to share with you the story of the Elwha, predominantly, and then I'll get into discussing the Nisqually a little bit. And there's going to be a good bit of history here uh, of the use of the river, the development of the river, then the efforts to remove the dams in order to restore the fisheries. And then I'll talk about the Nisqually Restoration and the Nisqually River in my upcoming book project there. And what I want to do is I want to start with, um, I'll pull up a map here, but I want to tell you how I got into this. So Natalie said sometimes long walks are where you get great ideas. And for me, I, got, I came back to the Northwest after four years in the Army. I was living in Seattle back in 89 and really just chomping at the bit to get up in the mountains and do some exploring. And I had a trip planned up the Elwha. It's a low elevation trail, so it's a good one in the winter. And a big snowstorm blew through. I thought maybe I'll have to cancel my plans, but I got myself a set of snowshoes from REI, and I snowshoed up in there. And so I had the Elwha Valley to myself for three days. I had elk walking through my camp, coyotes yipping at night, just one of the most beautiful landscapes I'd ever seen. And it captured my heart the Elwha River Valley did, as it has so many people. This is what I found working on this project. A good friend of mine in graduate school, he proposed to his wife in the Elwha River Valley at Hume's Ranch, uh, which is a particularly beautiful place. And so I became enamored with this landscape, but as many people do in a landscape that's changed over time, that in many places has been degraded, I tried to imagine what it was like before what it was like before white settlement arrived, what it was like before the dams were built. As I crossed these creeks and these rivers, I tried to imagine what it would have looked like with a 100-pound Chinook swimming his way up, or, or thousands upon thousands of coho or pink salmon pushing their way up these creeks and streams. And so the Elwha was always a place of active imagination for me, a place I returned to time and again. And as a student, I was an activist, I wrote letters, I found out that there was an effort to remove the Elwha dams. I said, I'm for that. I didn't give any thought. I didn't think about the jobs that were based on the dams, its role in the economy. I just was in favor of a restored river with salmon runs. So I wrote some letters and things like that. I went to some meetings. 
And then I got to graduate school in 94, and I ran into this professor who became my advisor, and he asked me what I want to do, and I said, well, I kind of want to write about mountains and forests, and he said, you're an environmental historian. And I had no idea that was a field. I didn't even know that existed as a field. You may know that, you may not. And thus began my long relationship with Paul Hurt, a very important environmental historian. And over time, I decided that I wanted to write this history of the Elwha River. In the beginning, I wanted to write a book that would help get people rallied to the removal of the dams. The legislation was passed in 92, and I'll talk about that. But 94, 95, it didn't seem like the dams would ever come out. There was a lot of opposition to it. And so I wanted to do something in the tradition of, say, Upton Sinclair, write a social protest book, get people mobilized. The complete opposite of what you're supposed to do as a historian, because we're supposed to be uh, as objective as possible, right, when we do our work. And as I did my research, I think I became a better historian because I learned this very complex, complicated story about the way people look at nature, the way they value nature, and how those values change over time with the rise of environmental ethics, but also two changes in the economy, right? And so in the end, to me, it just became an interesting story that I could tell, even while, of course, always advocating for the Elwha and for restoration. And so let's start with the place itself. You can see the Elwha River on the map there. This is the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. How many people have been there? Oh, wow, great. So this is a room full of backpackers and fly fishermen and campers, right? So when I would talk about this in Texas, I got a lot of blank looks. And I talk about salmon, and I get all starry-eyed about salmon, blank looks. I mean, they have their parts of nature they appreciate, but these are different sort of bioregions and cultures. So the Elwha River then, is seven miles west of Port Angeles. It's 41 miles long, has a watershed of 281 square miles, 83% of which is in, protected within the Olympic National Park, which is crucial because that habitat is close to pristine. It's a very healthy habitat. Most of it's never been logged, and the land use on that land within the Olympic National Park has been limited to ranching and farming in the early 20th century, which which failed or was moved out because of the creation of the park. I'm going to move to another map really quickly. This is just, sorry. OK. It's acting up on me. Just give me a second here. All right. So this map here on the upper right, um, oh, sorry, I use Prezi. I don't know why it's doing this. Um, OK, well, I'm just going to have to stop, because this is turning into a weird <laughs> pantomime. Uh, so on the top there, what you have is, um, just a, a map of the watershed itself. And what I want to tell you about the Elwha River is that it's a 41 mile long river. You know, it's, it's an impressive river, but you would never imagine that at one time it hosted 500,000 salmon. It's just, it doesn't look like it has that capacity. In odd numbered years, you get the pink salmon runs, which would number between 250 and 350,000. Okay, it's also famous for, so it hosted five Pacific salmon, all of five Pacific salmon and steelhead trout, right? And so besides the large numbers of salmon overall on the pink salmon, it was famous for its Chinook. And it had Chinook or king salmon that would reach over 100 pounds and were over six feet in length. Even 17 years after the dam first, the two dams were built, they were still catching 100 pound Chinook in the bottom part of that river. And it's the, that's for two reasons. One. The Chinook Elwha, the fall run, spend an extra year in the Pacific, so they get larger. But also, too, they've adapted to some really narrow slot canyons and also to waterfalls. You probably know Chinook can jump as much as 10 feet to get upstream. And that's a fish that uses that whole river. They make it all the way up into the Bailey Range, the very headwaters of the river itself. And so that's an important piece to know about the Elwha River itself is the productivity of it in terms of salmon. And of course, there's a whole watershed ecosystem dependent on these salmon, right? Black bears, raccoons, bald eagles, ravens, uh, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, reliant on the, the 
nutrients coming from the carcasses when they rot. And so that's an important part of that upstream habitat. Downstream, of course, seals, sea lions, killer whales, and other species dependent on these salmon. And the picture here that I probably won't be able to get to, uh, this is the lower Elwha Sklallam Indians. And they've lived along the Elwha for at least 1,200 years. They'll say, and I think rightly so, they've been there for thousands of years. And the salmon were the centerpiece of their, their economy. I mean, they could literally harvest enough salmon for the year in a few days if they were so inclined. So the salmon were crucial to their economy, but also their culture. And that's evidenced by this picture here of the first salmon ceremony. And the first salmon ceremony is the most important religious ceremony of Northwest Coastal Tribes, where they bring the salmon chief. This would be the salmon that's leading the spawning run. And if you've seen the spawning run, right, they come at once. You can, if you have a high point, you can see the shadow, right, as they come in. They bring salmon chief into the village. The uh, spiritual leader goes through this first salmon ceremony. There are prayers to the salmon. Everyone partakes of the flesh unless there's a taboo against someone specifically. Then they place that carcass with a headpiece, a chief's headpiece on his head on a raft and they float it back out to the ocean because they want salmon chief to bring the salmon people back again the next year, right? So there's their religious understanding of their relationship with the salmon or salmon people, but they also took very specific measures to make sure salmon runs continued to exist. They would take out traps one day a week when they built weirs across the river, they would leave holes underneath them or disassemble them one day a week. They did what the businessmen that came in the 1850s and 1860s did not. They allowed enough river to get up, salmon to get upstream to reproduce. So the salmon are the most important part of their economy, but of course, they don't just live on salmon. Seals, the lower Elwha Sklallam were famous for their clams. That was a key trading item for them. They had really productive clam beds at the mouth of the river. Uh, where the, uh, the delta of the river was, and harvest a number of other species. I won't spend a lot of time on that. I really, I'm gonna do this one more time. There's this one picture I really want you to see. There we go. So what happens though is what happened everywhere in America. Settlers arrived, or what the Sklallam called newcomers. And in the 1850s and 1860s, you get a wave of settlement in the Northern Olympic Peninsula. And that's mostly farming. They, as was typical, they moved into the areas where Indians burned to encourage crafts for elk and deer. They set up you know, cattle operations there, grain and potato farming there. And then they began to saddle, settle along the water. They built Port Angeles, right, Port Townsend, and forced the native peoples off their land. And the 1855 Point No Point Treaty was a specific treaty that moved the Lower Elwha off the Elwha River actually was relocating them to a completely different part of the state in the southern end of Hood Canal. And so they go through this process of being dispossessed. They resist that relocation, actually. They remain in the Elwha River area, but they have a hard time holding on to the land around there. And that's a whole other story that I'm not going to do today. And so with that settlement, of course, you have the boosters and the businessmen, right? And uh, if you're doing Western history and environmental history, Carl Abbott has a great book called Booster and Businessmen. He talks about their role as community leaders. But in Port Angeles, been to Port Angeles? Not a great thriving city, right? Now, they called it the uh, Gate City to the Pacific, City of Destiny, this glittering metropolis. The Boosters put together pamphlets that they would send to the East Coast, that they would send to Chicago, for example, to encourage both settlement and to recruit capital. And Bill Robbins, who wrote Hard Times in Paradise, we were talking about that earlier tonight, talks about the role of migratory capital in developing the West. If you look at the ranching operations of Wyoming, the gold mines of Colorado, uh, the dams built in many places before it became a public project, that's all money that comes from the East Coast, Chicago, and Europe, right? So they have this vision. How do we take Port Angeles and turn it into this great port city that's going to be at the center of trade with San Francisco and Asia. And they said, well, we need to build the dam, right? We need to harness the power that's in that river and convert that to hydroelectricity in order to build mills, for example, sawmills, later on paper mills, and other things. They also talked about the benefit from electricity in very populist terms, right? So cable cars, 
libraries, opera houses, lights in people's cities. So it wasn't just to get rich, right? It wasn't just to create jobs or to create wealth, but to try to benefit society overall. This fellow named Thomas Aldwell uh, is interesting. He's the man who comes up with a plan to build this dam. He wrote a book called Conquering the Wilderness. So that tells you a lot about Thomas Aldwell. Not a terribly complex figure in his own autobiography, but he arrives and he says, we need a dam here. He, he very sneakily buys up all the land up and down the river where the dam's gonna go, where the reservoir is gonna be, and he starts recruiting capital over a 10 year period. But you cannot recruit enough capital there. There's not enough money in that community. So he goes to Chicago, which of course confirms the point of people like William Cronin, William Robbins, about capital in the East developing the West. And he gets $2 million, comes back, and he builds this dam, right? And this dam's built, they start in 1911. The first dam blows out in the bottom of the canyon there. They built the bottom of the dam on top of about 14 feet of settlement and gravels. Um, Aldwell was actually complaining to the investment firm, but they were ignoring him. He knew it was a problem. And so the water scowled out underneath, blew that out. And so they had to build a second dam, which then held. So still not doing what I want exactly. And that's the Elwha Dam before it came down. So we, if we've grown up seeing dams like the Grand Coulee Dam, the Hoover Dam, right? This is not that dam. All right, took my dad to see it because he's like, what are you, why are you writing about dams? He was conservative and he liked dams. And I said, well, you know, uh, the salmon and all that. I took him there and he's like, hell, that's not a dam. I could dig that out myself, right? And it, you know, it was leaking, it's covered in moss, but that's what it looked like before it was taken out in 2011. So the first dam, the Elwha Dam, was built in 1913. This dam, which looks a little bit more like the dams we know, was completed in 1927. That's the Glines Canyon Dam. That's built several miles upstream. But the dam that did the most damage is the Elwha Dam, the, the ancient looking dam that's on the lower river and it's five miles from the mouth of the river itself. And the primary impact, of course, is the destruction of the salmon runs because they didn't build any fish passageways. Now there's two things you need to know. One, Washington State had passed a law in 1893 banning dams without fish passageways, okay? Two, the company promised to build fish passageways. And when they said, no, we don't have the technology to do that, they said, okay, we'll build an elevator. But they did make a commitment to try to preserve those upstream salmon, and the law was broken, that commitment was not kept. So we get a destruction of the salmon it takes a long time, so you lose all the upstream salmon, right? Because you've lost all that habitat. The salmon runs downstream, look healthy for several decades, but there's an ongoing deterioration of the downstream river habitat. That means by the 1970s, you're only gonna get about three to 5,000 salmon a year. So from 500,000 salmon to three to 5,000. If you're gonna do ecosystem services and ecological economics, run the numbers on that. You know, 100 years or 90 years of not collecting somewhere between 300 to 500,000 salmon roughly every year. Well, what's the cost of that in terms of just straight economics? Um, getting ahead of myself a little bit. So the dam's completed and they hire this, they appoint this new Washington State Fish Commissioner, Leslie Darwin. And Leslie Darwin was what we call a muckraker. He's a progressive conservationist. So if you've been in history class and you got a historian talking about 1900 to 1917 and the progressives and the creation of all these laws that made workplaces safer, that tried to more efficiently manage resources for current and future years, that's who he is. And he's a muckraker in that he has a newspaper in Bellingham where he's writing all these editorials just constantly slamming the cannery industry because the cannery industry was destructive and wasteful. Roughly 40% of the salmon that are harvested back in the late 19th, early 20th century are wasted. They don't even get canned and shipped out. There's this abundance of salmon that makes people careless and reckless. So Darwin had been a strong critic of them. Washington elected in 1912 uh, Ernest Lister, a progressive governor. He appoints Darwin. So Darwin is the first Washington State 
fish commissioner that's not owned by the industry. And he's very critical. And he comes in and he finds out about this dam. And he's getting reports from employees saying, hey, I went to the dam today. And there are thousands of fish jumping and smashing their heads against this dam, trying to get upstream. But I've been told they're going to build an elevator. So Darwin then engages in a negotiation with the builder of the dam, Aldwell. And it's an ongoing debate, right? And in the end, what they agree to is to build a hatchery at the base of the dam. And for environmentalists who are producing material during the fight to remove the dams, Darwin was a traitor. He was someone who was bought off because he built a cannery, I'm sorry, a hatchery. But of course, in the 90s, we were starting to realize the problems with hatcheries. In 1913, hatcheries looked like a solution. Hatcheries looked like a panacea. And Leslie Darwin truly believed, absolutely, completely believed, that the dam could be used as a collecting structure. So that they changed, they got rid of the 1893 law, rewrote it and changed it so dams could be sites where you collected the eggs and the fertilizer from the salmon. And if you built a hatchery, then that would make it okay. But he believed, and as did almost everyone else, that hatcheries could not only produce as much fish as a river would, a healthy ecosystem would on its own, but produce more fish. And this is a classic sort of progressive perspective. What's here, how can we make it better through science? And so under Darwin, we get this agreement to build a hatchery at the Elwha Dam. And also, too, he expands hatchery production in Washington State from 17 to 31 hatcheries. This is over the course of about eight years. And also increases the amount of, of, of smolts that are produced from 4.5 million to over a billion. What he does when he does that is he creates a model that facilitates development, right? Because the belief then is if you're building a hatchery, then you can build dams. You can overlog. You can allow overgrazing because the hatcheries are going to take care of that problem. So then we have a century of overdevelopment, over um, use of resources, building of dams, because we believe hatcheries can fix that. But I'm not overly critical of Darwin because I spent a lot of time in his letters. He was desperately trying to find a solution. And you have to remember the political economy of America, the Pacific Northwest, the Washington State at this time was one in which there was no interest in being stewards of resources. And he had little regulatory power. He couldn't go blow that dam up, right? So that's the deal he makes. The, the dam is in some respects a failure, the dams. When Aldwell proposed the dams, he believed he produced enough hydroelectricity for the entire Olympic Peninsula. Port Townsend, Permerton, the shipyards, this was going to create a glittering peninsula. And in the end, the power from those dams only produced power for the mill there in Port Angeles, and only part of that power. And the hatchery is a failure. The hatchery just does not produce salmon, and they shut that down within about four or five years, 1922. So th there's failures there, but there's also a model that's going to sort of bedevil us and our management of fisheries for the next 100 years. So the dams block the spawning salmon, but then there's this ongoing deterioration of the downstream river. And one of the biggest issues is the dams stopping the flow of sediment, gravel, sand, rock, and silt, and woody debris. And when I started this project, there wasn't actually a ton of research on the importance of sediments and woody debris and healthy salmon rivers. And of course, since then, there's been tons of research on that. So I was really excited to, to be reading this stuff as it was coming out. So the dams start the flow of these, these gravels and sands. As you know, probably, salmon need gravels, rocks, and sand for reds, right? That's where they lay their eggs, they fertilize them, cover them, and it allows the eggs to stay aerated as water goes through the reds, right? So downstream of the dams, all those sediments get washed downstream, so you get an armored river bottom. So it gets much harder for the salmon downstream to be able to reproduce themselves. Woody debris has a lot of impacts on the structure of a river. So you think of a tree that gets caught sideways in a river or a big stump. It forces water around it, right? It leads to sided, uh, side channels, braided channels. It can drive water down to scour out the bottom, which creates a deep pool. There are multiple benefits to this to create a complex river ecosystem. 
Uh, for example, a deep pool is a place where a spawning salmon can rest before it charges upstream again. It's a place where a smolt, as it's working its way downstream, can hide from predators, especially if there's a big log it can get behind or a stump it can get inside of, right? And those decomposing stumps and logs also contribute nutrients to the river ecosystem. The braided channels, the side channels created by woody debris also provide good habitat for species like pink salmon for their spawning and reproduction. So you're losing all of that downstream, this ongoing degradation of the downstream habitat. The water flow from the dams is not managed responsibility in a responsible fashion. There were fluctuations from between 1,500 cubic feet per second to 10, right? These dams were there entirely to produce hydroelectricity for the mill. And so when they needed it, they'd let the water go. When they didn't need it, they would shut it down. And what that means then is when they release a lot of water, they would flush the river up over its banks. Any spawning salmon or smolts that are in that river get flushed up over the side of the banks when the water recedes, they're trapped. And there's a form of descent and resistance that takes place for the lower Elwha Sklalem living downstream of these dams. One of the things they tried to do on a regular basis was go out and collect those smolts. So the children and the adults would grab buckets, run out there, collect smolts, put them in the buckets and carry them back to the river. They would gather up the adults and take them back to the river. But again, you can imagine this ongoing process of irresponsible management of water flow and its impact on the salmon fishery over time. It's very, um, very damaging. And I have this really neat uh, section from the book. And what I found, and this is if you do research like this, I, I wrote my dissertation, I was working on my book, I hit some snags. So I decided to go back to my original research. And there was gold in there that I didn't see when I first started this work because I didn't understand it. And what I found were, and it, it led to two new chapters, essentially, I found a series of letters from the Port Angeles area, 1930s through the 1960s. And these are people that are members of the Chamber of Commerce, they're fishermen, they're businessmen, they're not environmentalists per se, who are writing letters to the Washington State Fish Commission, to other agencies saying, what are you going to do about this dam? What are you going to do about these fisheries and the way it's being managed? And specifically in one case, uh, one man wrote, he's talking about the change in flow from mismanagement of the water from the dam. Is it just that one man can control a river which belongs to all of us, kill millions of fish each year and not even one word is whispered about it? So he, he is making kind of a moral argument there, right? And then there's these two other characters who I wish I could travel back in time and meet. They, um, they sent letters, packages, to Milo Bell, who was a technical advisor for Washington State Fish Commission. He ended up working on the Columbia River dams as well, was instrumental over the building the fish passageways. And they said, you know, we're out on the Elwha, and they had raised the water, they'd done a water release, and then they shut it down. We found all these smolts trapped on the banks, and so we gathered some of them. I counted 66, and, and here they are. They put them in a package and mailed them to them. And then another guy, so there's, that was one fellow. Then another guy, he's three streets away. I, I pulled up to Port Angeles. I actually walked up in Port Angeles, and I found that these guys were three streets away. So I'm going to assume they were buddies, right, who have been fishing together and decided to do this. And so he also wrote a letter saying, you need to fix this. Here's some smolts. And by the way, I'll be sending you more smolts occasionally, right, kind of like a, a threat. And uh, I would love to see what Milo had to say about that, but I've never seen that source. And so you see resistance there. You see an ongoing dissent or a rhetoric about the importance of the river and finding a way to manage those dams. But for the fisheries biologists and employees of the state, there was no solution. They could not breach the dams. All they could do was talk about trucking salmon, building elevators, backpacking them, and they were desperately trying to come up with solutions up into the 1970s when that solution radically changed. And then, of course, you get warmer water when you have the low flows like that. The temperatures go up, and of course, salmon, once you hit 73, that kills almost all salmon, so increases in diseases, uh, issues like that. I'm going to speed up just a little bit so I don't go over time here. Maybe. So this is when we get to a crucial moment in American history, 
that's unprecedented, <laughs> and that is a movement to restore the dams. And it starts with the lower Elwal Sklallam. In 1976, they said, enough, we want the dams out. And so they try to, they, they sue to block the relicensing of the dams. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has to give a dam a license every 50 years. But the Electric Consumers Protection Act had not been passed yet. So at this point, I'm looking at Professor Chapin here because I know he deals with these issues. They, um, they weren't looking at the environmental consequences of the dams as much, right? And so they're tired of trying to manage these fisheries in um, opposition to dam owners who show no interest in a state that's not really doing much. And one reason they could sue is because the passage of the Bolt, the, the Bolt decision of 1974, where Judge Bolt said, based on the Point No Point Treaty, 1850, uh, Point No Point 1855, Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854, the Indians have access to 50% of the salmon, other resources like clams and things like this. So this gives them now legal standing to block this relicensing because the dams are blocking their access to 50% of a healthy salmon fishery. But in the 1980s, you start to have increasing talk in the Olympic National Park community, the people working for the park, the fisheries biologists, and one guy in particular, Bruce Brown, who wrote a wonderful book called Mountain in the Clouds, which is actually what kind of got me into the Elwha River. He was a fisheries biologist who loved the landscape of the Olympic Mountains, loved the salmon, so he writes in this very beautiful, evocative way, and he tells the story of the way the Elwha was mismanaged, to be kind. And he throws out that idea, was it possible to take these dams out? And he brings this up at a keynote address he gives with the Olympic National Park. And so there's increasing interest there. And then all of a sudden, things just start to pop. There's a letter to the Olympic National Park saying, why can't we tear out the dams? Local environmentalists in, in Port Angeles say, there's no good reason to, take, to not take these dams out. They don't do anything economically significant. And that's, that's how the Elwha dams are different than maybe the Columbia River dams, right, and other dams. They don't produce a lot of electricity. There aren't a lot of people that are economically dependent on them. And so much of the watershed is contained with, inside a national park. It, it is a really unique sort of story. And then several environmental groups, Ottoman Society, um, uh, Olympic Park Associates, Friends of the Earth, and uh, Sierra Club join as interveners in this lawsuit to try to block relicensing of the dams. So there's a long period here negotiating, do we sue, do we deploy the Bolt decision, and do a federal takings, or do we try to come up with a better solution? And under the leadership of Congressman Al Swift, in cooperation in particular with the Sierra Club, they decided to come up with what's called the creative solution. And they came up with this remarkable win-win idea, and they had the Bonneville Power Administration come out and do an audit of the mill and see how much they could reduce their energy consumption just through improving efficiencies. And they were able to reduce their energy consumption quite a bit. And also, too, they agreed to sell the mill that's relying on the Elwha dams electricity at the cost they were paying with the dams. That, that's crucial. But this is a long extended negotiation. And by doing that and through debate and discussion and meetings, they're able to build complete consensus around removal of the dams. Right? Chamber of Commerce, Port, An Port Angeles has always been a conservative community. It's a resource extraction based economy traditionally. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce supported it. The dam owners supported it. Of course, they were trying to get out from underneath a, a pretty big liability. Uh, and they were going to get paid. Uh, the mill owners supported it. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, of course, supported it, Department of Interior. So they had consensus around this. And a bipartisan delegation from Washington st State unanimously supported the 1992 Elwall Restoration Act calling for removal of the dams. This is unprecedented in American history. Right? <coughs> Senator Slade Gordon, for a short while, supported this. And, Jenner, and President George Herbert Walker Bush signed off on it. And that called for a study of the river and the salmon and, if deemed necessary, removal of the dams at federal expense to restore the fisheries. That was 1992. Del Wall Dam doesn't come out in 2011, right? And in fact, I was telling the story tonight. I was working on the book. It came out in 2011. And we had done the last edits. It was going to the press. 
The dam wasn't actually out yet. And for one, of my first, one of my chapters starts with, now that the dams have been out for a few months, and my editor said, are you sure you want to put that in there based on everything we've seen? That's a big risk. And I was like, yeah, I think we're there. But I was really nervous that something would come up and block the removal of the dams. And so you can see here uh, a careful process of removal of the Glines Canyon Dam upstream. They removed the Elwha Dam first. And they, they did it in steps. Because behind those dams are 18 million square meters of sediment, right? Mountains of sediment piled up behind them. So they can't just you know, be neat to blow up the dam. They got to take them out carefully and release sediment a little bit at a time because that sediment causes turbi turbidity, right? The river gets really dirty, and that's bad for salmon. They'll, they'll get all that dirt in their, in their gills and they'll suffocate, for example. It'll choke the reds. So they do a very slow, careful process over about two to three years. And then here you can see in the, the Elwha Reservoir, you can see crews here replanting trees. I'm getting to a point here in just a second. And here they're collecting salmon to, uh, to harvest eggs and fertilizer. Uh, so there's this long process where Senator Slade Gordon decides he no longer supports removal of the dams, right? And everyone has, has anyone read um, Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner? Yeah, I went to a talk he gave in Lewiston. First thing he said was, well, there's something atavistic about people in dams because they, they must want the L wall because they're still there. I had been drinking. I was like, you're wrong, right? And I said what I just said to you guys. Consensus support. He's like, I didn't know that. And then uh, I made some comment. I made the classic error. I said Slime Gordon instead of Slade Gordon. Because those of us who worked on environmental issues and or cared about native rights just were constantly running athwart Slade Gordon's opposition. So Slade Gordon had supported this legislation. He changed his mind. And he changed his mind. I was going to do a count. I can't remember. At least three times. It might have been more. But essentially, what happens is he decides this is too much money. He does, and he's, of course, the chair of the Appropriations Committee. That's what makes it possible for him to have this much power. And then the Elwha fight gets caught up in the debate over the Lower Snake River dams that took place from roughly 94 to 96, 97. There was a really heated debate about breaching the Lower Snake River dams. So it's like Gordon's like, oh, now we have these environmentalists from Seattle and the East Coast, and they're going to want to tear out the Columbia dams next. And so I'm not going to prove anything unless we get a guarantee that the Snake River dams and Columbia dams stay in place. And then he argued, and this was the piece for me that was the most interesting, the other stuff was fairly predictable, was he said, well, this has been done against the will of the local people in Port Angeles. He said, they don't want this. And so the community organized the Port Angeles Advisory Council. This included businessmen, people that worked for the park, um, members of the Chamber of Commerce, local environmentalists. They spent about two years studying this issue, having town meetings, reading the material, came back and unanimously supported removal of the dams which made him change his position until he changed it again. But over time, and due to the Clinton administration, the appropriations were released a little bit at a time to finally you got to the point where you could remove those dams. One of the benefits of it taking so long was it allowed for careful planning of the restoration process, the way the dams would be dismantled, the way they would use a mix of hatchery production and wild stocks, to rebuild the runs on the river, but also allowed them to do a series of baseline studies on river hydrology, mammal biology, nearshore biology, salmon, everything else, so they could carefully assess the science, the impact of the dam removals themselves. And this is one way in which the Elwha is going to be influential for a very long time because of all the science being generated um, by the dam removals and those baseline studies. So I'm going a little over time here. Let me go through a few things. The salmon have come back in spades. They came back right away. When they, blew, when they took out the Glines Canyon Dam, three days later, um, mature, uh, I'm sorry, spawning Chinook swam right past it. Three weeks later, they were in the Bailey Range. They were as far as you could go in that river ecosystem. 
In 2015, there was a 350% increase in Chinook Reds in the river and a 300% increase in um, steelhead reds in the river. This map here shows you that Chinook and steelhead and coho will make it all the way up here into the Bailey Range. Pinks and chum, they don't jump very well. They'll be down here in the delta, floodplains, the side channels, and the lower part of the river. And then over there, you see Lake Sutherland. That's the sockeye. And there's an interesting story here. The sockeye runs, when the dam went up, were trapped. And they turned into kokanee, right? And so and they wondered, what's going to happen if we take the dams out and we don't plant stock? So they decided not to plant sockeye. They said, well, they should switch back. And apparently, that's already happened. They have sockeye. Either they've been, the river's already been colonized by sockeye from another river, or kokanee are already converting back to sockeye. They had 32,000 um, coho smolts leave the river last year. So this has already been a resounding success. And they're hoping, fingers crossed, that they might get as many as 150,000 pink salmon next year. The projections are within 25 years, about 6,000 Chinook. The historic numbers were between 8,000 and 10,000. Around 12,000 coho, 250,000 pink. So we're going to see the numbers if we don't see the 100-pound Chinook in a relatively short time, right? By the time you guys reach middle age. So you can start planning your fishing trips. So that's been a great success. Well, I keep waiting for the, the Laura Walsh-Clallam to, they should do like the Colorado River and build a, a list of people that are reserving 10 years out the first lead fishing trips in the Elwha. I, I want to be in that, that boat. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit here. And this is one of the parts of the story that never occurred to me as I did this work towards the end, as I looked at some of the baseline research, I started learning it. But I've been following this uh, organization, the Coastal Watershed Institute. And Ann Schaefer is a fishery, she's a marine biologist and a nearshore specialist who runs that. And I follow them on Facebook, I get emails. And it's amazing what's happened in the delta. So there was that, that 18 million square meters of sediment trapped behind the dams. With the removal of the dams, that's all flushed downstream, right? So before the dams, this was it. This was the beach. There, was, there were no sandbars. There was no delta. Now there are 85 acres of sandbar delta in, in the future, you know, good beach, right? And I was going to say, and clamming beds. The clams aren't back yet. And roughly five to six million square meters have flushed downstream. And what that has meant down here is a return of multiple species that have not been seen in 60, 70 years. Uh, Ulicon, right, which is otherwise known as candlefish. They're so filled with oil, you can light and they'll burn. Very important fish for the native peoples there. A very important foundation fish. Everything eats them. Salmon from seals, seagulls, you name it. The return of sand lance, surf smelt, the return of Dungeness crabs, because when they lost the sediments, this became all kelp beds. When the sediments came back, the eel grass started reestablishing itself. That brings back the herring, brings back the Dungeness crab. So they're seeing a return of all these species there. And so, for example, in the Elwha River, the Ulicon, which had not been seen for like 60, 70 years, they spawn at the highest point where the uh, seawater reaches up the river, that inner, uh, inner tidal zone, I'll say that. And they spawn in silts. They need silt to do that. And then sand lance and surf smelt, they actually spawn on the beach in really fine grained sand, none of which was available. So what we're seeing is with the removal of the dams and the flushing out of all these sediments, a return of a very healthy nearshore ecosystem, which is benefiting numbers of species. And of course, they're getting plenty of juvenile salmon in here as well. So, um, one other benefit, too, as you go downstream from here towards Port Angeles, you have all these homes up on high bluffs, and which have been eroding because the beaches have been eroding. These longshore currents are depositing these sediments, and they've added between one and a half to three feet to the beaches, which is providing some protection to those properties. And that was also an unanticipated benefit. So there's just a remarkable number of benefits arising from the restoration of the Elwha, a lot of which we're still learning to see, you know, learning, uh, waiting to see what happens. Um, and then let me jump to 
a couple of quick closing points. I want to get to some of the questions that, that drive this series. I'm not going to talk about the Nisqually restoration now, but what I want to do is get at some of the questions that kind of drive the work I do. And when I wrote this book, my intent was to write this for not necessarily fellow academics. It was to write it for people that would hike the L1. In fact, when the book came out, I was totally goofy. I went hiking up the L1. I took five copies. And everyone I ran into in the trail was like, here, I have a copy of my book. <laughs> I did that. I was like, you know, they're up here. And who knows what they thought? I never saw an Amazon review. But, um, but, I, you know, but I want people to share that love and that passion, but based on a deep, nuanced understanding of the history and use of that river and its ecosystem. And this is what my field does. I mean, when it's doing its job right, that's what my field does. And helps people develop a bioregional knowledge and also understand the cultural geography of a place as well. The various historical events, the cultures that have lived there and continue to live there. And that gives us a better understanding of our place and our relationship with it. Also, too, for me, there's a big emphasis on trying to educate people about ecosystem services. And this is where I'm kind of moving towards in my own work is really, because a lot of my work now really emphasizes climate change. My last chapter actually um, talks about climate change, and this was 2011, so there wasn't as much being published on it back then, believe it or not. Um, but trying to show how, for example, restoration work helps build resilience, but also, too, creates a number of ecosystem services, like carbon sequestration, right? Like prodigious salmon runs, which have both habitat, cultural, and economic values. And for me, I have a very simplistic approach. Um, I really want to call out mistakes. You know, I feel like, you know, I, I've gone to a lot of hearings. I went to the Lower Snake River hearings, and what was said over and over again was, well, they're here too bad. I'm like, yeah, but the Corps of Engineers suppressed the research to show the smolts would be destroyed and they're going through the Germans. That's got to be worth something, right? No, too bad, right? And so I think it's important to look at decisions that were made in the past and the damage that comes from those decisions, the injustice that was done both to communities and to nature, and find ways to rectify that. And restoration is one of those crucial strategies. And what I believe and what I argue is that restoration work is the way we're building a land ethic in America. Now the Leopold back in the 40s, his book, Sand County Almanac, was published in 48, but he wrote it before then. The, the land ethic argued that any ethical system has to take into consideration the rights of nature as well. He said it much more eloquently than I just did. And we have failed uh, dramatically to build a land ethic in America. But when I look around this country, when I look at the building of oyster reefs in Matagorda Bay in Texas, and the bison project on the Great Plains, and all of the rivers and creeks and pocket estuaries that are being restored all over Puget Sound. What I see here are people in communities and agencies that are taking that land ethic seriously and trying to find ways to enact that through restoration. And then finally, of course, all that builds resilience. And as we are facing a climate change crisis, although my taxi driver argued with me about it, it's been a while since I've had an argument about climate change. Building resilience into ecosystems, building resilience into communities based on having healthy ecosystems is a crucial strategy. And restorations, like on the Elwha River, are, are one of those strategies. And I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So for the Hey Dukes among us, um, <laughs> have you seen any movements for removal of the John Day? I have not. It's been a while since I was a Hey Duke myself, uh, but I, I don't know. And I, and I just moved back to Washington uh, eight months ago, and I'm in academic administration now, so I don't keep up with things as much as I should. So I don't know. Do you know about that? or? small underground, not underground things, but there are cultural movements from where all the places you're talking about. And there's, I, I get little cultural um, voices about, talk about removing the John Day. Right. But it's obviously not as loud as the Lower Snake, but what would you recommend then for moving forward and convincing people 
that beyond the economic uh, the detriment to the economy of removing large hydroelectric dams? What kind of, what kind of tools do you use to communicate the benefit? Uh, well, and a, um, Dr. Chapman has studied the Klamath River, which is probably more typical of conversations about dam removal than the Elwha. And even with the Elwha, there was some pretty strong opposition, which I didn't get into, where you have constituencies with water rights who are accustomed to using the water or who ship out their wheat or lumber resources, and so they're economically dependent. And so the key there is dialogue. It's bringing partners to the table and finding ways to, to agree that this is something that needs to happen, but also finding ways to actually pay for it as well. And so it becomes a much more difficult issue with dams like John Day or the Lower Snake River dams. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yes. So obviously every dam is different, but are there other sort of areas with dams that you, from a sort of historical perspective, you think are especially unique or kind of notable for a variety of reasons? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Basically, because Elwha is a pretty unique case study. Right. Really true. And are there other examples, probably somewhere in the West, that you think are more also unique for other reasons that may be considered writing a book on? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, my next book I want to be on the Nisqually River and where there's some restoration work and also the Deschutes River in Olympia, not the other Deschutes. Um, where they're, they're trying to restore um, the estuary there in downtown Olympia. Um, I think what's happened over the last 10, 15 years is a lot of those unique kinds of dams have been removed. Dams that were built in the early 20th century with low energy production that, you know, you, you look at the cost in terms of the damage the salmon runs and the actual energy production like the Little Marmot Dam, the Conda Dam, dams like that where it's like, okay, this makes sense, right? And of course, the passage of the Electric Consumers Protection Act that made FERC take environmental issues seriously, which has then been deployed uh, by activists looking for dam removal. So I can't name a dam off the top of my head like that. I'd like to see the Lower Snake River Dam discussion get. I, I've heard there's another, there's another study taking place. I'd like to see that take place again, because I don't think there's any reason for those to exist. So, yeah, Brian. I want to I push you into a hypothetical real quick um, based on some of, the, some of the research that I've done. The, uh, take, take, the, take the lower slalom out of, the, out of the equation in this biophysical region. Would this dam removal have happened? Um, well, uh, let me do a comparative, and we're going to be talking about in your class, the Kennebec Dam, the Edwards Dam in the Kennebec River where that was re removed in 2001. There were no native peoples involved uh, that I'm aware of. These were members of Trout Unlimited, local environmentalists, and they were able to compel the FERC to find against the dam or to actually demand such exorbitant changes to the dam that it made no economic sense to keep the dam in place and led to removal of the dam. But one reason that happened on the Edwards Dam and other cases was because of what happened in the L1. I didn't get into this, but um, as these groups are negotiating and trying to get the dams removed, FERC is dragging its feet. It's not taking it seriously. And John Dingle, who's the chair of a subcommittee of energy and commerce, it's a multiple name subcommittee, I can't remember, becomes this passionate advocate. And he's writing these blistering letters to FERC saying, why aren't you taking this seriously? And he's basically just, and this is why writing to your congressman is so very important. He's saying exactly what Friends of the Earth is saying in their brochures and their letters. He's using all the arguments, magnificent salmon, prodigious runs, dams that produce no electricity. And he's able to convince FERC to start taking this issue seriously, and like they're legally required to now since 1986. And while they don't make a decision on this particular case, there's no federal takings, I think it plays out in the Edwards Dam. And that's a project for somebody to do. I haven't done it. So hypothetically, and I think what this is getting to, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the big weapon you had in this case was the Bolt decision, right? And so the threat of suing for removal of dams was always there. And so when you came up and said, well, instead, 
we'll pay for everything. And also, too, no one's jobs are going to get lost. You came up with a much better solution. But that, that can't always happen, as, right, like with the Klamath. They couldn't do that there. So I don't know if that answers your question. That's perfect. That's where I wanted to go with that. And if you, if you don't mind, if there's not another question, you, you mentioned something at dinner that I think is really important. We talk a lot about um, dam removals or uh, river restorations in an area where there's a, there's a tribal um, there's a tribal nation or tribal land, and, and, and using that as a tool to build to, for the tribe to regain sovereignty over resources and land. But you were telling us about some unintended consequences for the tribe that I'd love for the audience to know a little bit more about. Yeah, so, um, so when I was a kid, I, I'll tell a little story. We used to fish out of Nia Bay. And that's where the macaw are. And um, I think we did this fishing trip about five years after the Bolt decision. And I had an uncle with a commercial fishing license. And I won't get into this part of it. He was <laughs> rich and he bought it just so he could catch more fish. Uh, and so he wasn't someone whose livelihood depended on this. And I remember when the Bolt decision passed, listening to my relatives and others talking in very negative, pejorative ways about native peoples. And I don't know if you know, but there were fights, there were gunshots exchanged. It was very tense. So five years later, I'm out there in the Macaw Reservation and a uh, strapping young high school man and almost got my butt kicked. I was chased by five Macaw youth all the way back to the marina where our boat was. And that's just, they called me honkies. And what are you doing here? Get off, get off my lands and don't catch my salmon. It was, it was so direct, it was stunning. Of course, I had no idea what any of that meant at that time, right? And so um, what I'm trying to get to is there has been a long negative representation of Native peoples in the Northwest and the West. And those of us who are older remember that being a common part of language, the way people talked about Indians. And the lower Elwas Clallam on their reservation was a very depressed reservation. 50% unemployment, no jobs, right? Little respect for that culture in the community. Now, there's the tribal initiative. All the schools in Washington State have to teach native culture. There is a slalom language class in the high school in Port Angeles that's taught by a member of the tribe. There's a museum in town, right? And they're deeply involved in a lot of community events. And then, of course, in Puget Sound, there are the great the canoe trips where all those coastal tribes travel in canoes all the way to Olympia. And like they used to do back in the day, they're announced as they arrive. I mean, they don't stand and dance with their face painted on planks between the canoes, but they announce who they are. So there's this cultural pride that's taken place, and it comes out of the hard work they did, because they own this. They started this process. But they became experts in managing fisheries. They have a fish hatchery and a rearing channel, and they kept those fish alive over those intervening years. They started writing environmental impact statements. They started collecting their cultural and environmental history for the documents needed to build support for removal of the dams. They started writing grants. And they became experts in all of those things. So there's a cultural pride that takes place as they rebuild their own economy and that species that was central to their economy. But there's also to a proficiency and expertise that comes out of participating in this process. What you get is this native civil society that's more autonomous and more confident and more great and more respected in the wider community. And I think that would also make a great research project for someone that's time. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. I was just going to ask you just your opinion on um, just the cost, for example, with lower state dams. It doesn't really seem like uh, in the economic conversation that they really are talking about how much they are spending just to try and get the fish around these dams. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I know that you've been a little bit, I've been as involved as I can be from afar, but I know you've been more involved. And, you know, what are you hearing about that? Are people talking about that? Because we're talking about spending even more money on something that's not working. Yeah. So I haven't been involved. So back when I was in graduate school, we would all hop in you know, our cars and drive down for the hearings in Lewiston, which were just great theater. You know, and uh, we were there once until 2 in the morning. I remember saying exactly what you're talking about. I talked about the cost of subsidizing this, the weed industry, right? The export of soft white weed, the trucking of the smolts. But I brought the subsidies of that. And you know, I was told to fuck off. You know, people were yelling at me to shut up and sit down.
And because I was trying to make the point that there are costs associated with supporting their, those farmers' lifestyles, right? Uh, their economy. And so those costs aren't included. But the reality is with the lower Snake River Dam, so again with the Elwha, that's all sediment that's washed out of the Olympic Mountains. The sediments behind the lower Snake River Dams, those are gonna be laced with what? Arsenic, lead, pesticides, right? There's gonna be DDT in there, right? Huh? Make it a super product. Yeah, and so the costs are exorbitant, right? So if you're gonna breach the lower Snake River Dams, you're undercutting uh, the pulp mills and the logging industry associated with that. You're undercutting Palouse farmers and their production of soft white wheat and sale to Asia, which I'm not sure that's important, but those are all decisions that have to take place in conversations uh, if you're gonna talk about breaching those lower snake river dams. But you do have an obligation because the Endangered Species Act does, for now, require you <laughs> to try to keep those species alive, so. Any other questions? Wow. Thank you very much for giving me your time. <laughs>